All righty. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, I'm going to jump right in because I want to make sure there's enough time for our Q&As and the audience Q&As. Um, thank you, all of our participants, for uh, our panelists for joining, and all the all of you at home or at work. Um, really excited to, to you know discuss the impact of data accessibility and open data tools on government and advocacy uh, in the advancement of environmental justice. My name is Carlos Piedad. Uh, I will be moderating today's panel. I'm a policy advisor on the strategic partnerships team at the Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice. Uh, there, I am honored to be working on the development of a citywide environmental justice report and mapping tool as part of the EJNYC initiative. Uh, I will speak to that a bit more, but first I want to introduce our, uh, oops, our expert panelists. Um, to that next slide. So we are joined today by Manuel Salgado, uh, who works as an environmental justice research analyst at WEACT for Environmental Justice. Based in WEACT's federal policy office in DC, Manny conducts research, data collection, and analysis to inform WEACT's efforts to advance equitable and just climate, transportation, energy, and toxic policies and practices at the local, state, and national levels. Some other research interests of Manny's are uh, addressing and mitigating climate change's disproportionate effects on BIPOC communities and increasing BIPOC representation in the sciences. Manny is currently completing his PhD in geography from Texas A&M University, where his research deals with measuring alpine snow using remote sensing techniques. Uh, up next, I'd like to introduce Tai Lung, who works in the EPA's Office of Environmental Justice and External Civil Rights. Uh, Tai has been working there since 2012, and his work focuses on the development of tools and policies that address low-income and minority populations overburdened by disproportionately high environmental pollution. Tai leads the EPA's efforts on the EJ Screen, a mapping and screening tool that combines environmental and demographic data to highlight areas with potential environmental justice concerns. And last but certainly not least, we are joined today by Dave Lachelle, who manages Esri's New York City office, where he focuses on solving urban challenges in partnership with government agencies. Dave is trained as a geographer and a GIS practitioner with over 30 years experience in applying location intelligence to some of the gov largest government utility and transit agencies in the US. Right now, he leads a team of experts supplying technology sciences and GIS to address a myriad of important issues like social equity, resiliency, community health, and effective governance. As a strategic consultant, Lachelle uh, concentrates on innovation and workforce behavior, integrating GIS with business systems and producing measurable results in making technology accessible and practical. Uh, we will be hearing more from each of our panelists soon about uh, their roles, but first I wanna give an overview of the work that we are doing here at MOCEJ to advance environmental justice. So uh, I am particularly excited uh, to be joining this event today because uh, we are currently developing an open data mapping tool in partnership with uh, Esri and Dave as part of the EJNYC initiative. Uh, the EJNYC initiative uh, is enabled by Local Laws 60 and 64 of 2017. This legislation established an environmental justice advisory board comprised of advocates, academics, and public health experts to advise our office as we implement these laws, as well as an interagency working group comprised of staff from 19 city agencies uh, with work that contributes to environmental and health uh, for all New Yorkers. There are three distinct um, deliverables to be um, mandated out of this legislation. Uh, the first being the EJNYC report, which is currently being developed, as well as the mapping tool. Uh, the, it requires that we conduct a citywide study on environmental justice concerns. Um, we actually held a public scoping process last year or in 2021, actually, uh, to decide uh, on the concerns to be selected for analysis. This report is meant to serve as the foundation for the uh, future EJNYC plan, which will outline agency specific recommendations um, to embed EJ into city decision making processes and policies. And it will also identify potential citywide initiatives to address environmental justice. And finally, uh, and most and excitedly, uh, there is the mapping tool, which we are currently developing uh, concurrently to the EJ report. This is going to be a public interactive map with a lot of exciting components to it. It's going to contain data collected from agencies represented on the IWG, uh, data that is relevant to the EJ concerns identified for the study, such as air quality, um, water quality, CSO overflow, 
uh, as well as data and information developed through the EJ study. So new data that hasn't yet been released. Uh, users will be able to explore the map through various base layers, such as uh, the legally defined environmental justice areas, uh, various political boundaries, health indicator data from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, uh, and future climate change data around coastal and stormwater flooding maps. Users will be able to identify the locations of stationary sources of pollution, waste management infrastructure, parks and open space, and other things. Um, another really big and important component to this mapping tool that we are really excited about is the amount of qualitative information uh, that is going to be presented in addition to uh, the various layers on the EJ concerns. Uh, so while exploring um, EJ concerns, users will be connected to relevant city and community-based resources. Uh, they'll be able to learn about you know, related health impacts, where their um, neighborhood ranks uh, in each EJ concern and more. So that is a really um, integral part to the, to the entire data tool. Uh, our intention for this mapping tool is to develop something that is gonna be used, um, that is useful uh, from advocacy groups, organizers, uh, policymakers, and city decision makers, as well as just interested citizens. Uh, we wanna provide a tool that can inform people about the EJ concerns in their city and empower individuals and organizations to continue advocating for the best possible outcomes in the neighborhoods. Once published, this mapping tool will continue uh, to be refined and updated whenever new data is made available. And we really are excited to see this thing go live. So that is all I have to share right now uh, on the uh, EJNYC initiative and our mapping tool. Um, but next, I'm going to kick things off to our panelists um, to share more information about the work that they're doing. Uh, so Manny, I'll, I'll, I'll pass it to you. All right. Thank you, Carlos. So yeah, as Carlos said, my name is Manny Salgado, and I'm an EJ research analyst with WE Act. And so you may be wondering what exactly an EJ research analyst does. And the majority of what I do involves using data science and data analysis in support of environmental justice. Um, recently, that's involved a lot of work looking at EPA rulemaking and providing testimony and comments supporting stronger rules for communities of color, such as a recent EPA rulemaking regarding methane, uh, the national ambient air quality standards for PM or particulate matter, and the Clean Air Act in regards to uh, upcoming rules on power generation, so power plants. Um, that's one aspect of my work. The largest aspect of my recent work has been analyzing federal mapping tools regarding environmental justice. Uh, some of these tools are the White House's Climate and Economic Justice Screening Tool and the Department of Transportation's Equitable Transportation Community Explorer. So we like to break these tools down, look at them and look at the data that they're using and see how well they're depicting the environmental and economic burden that are shouldered by communities of color. Next slide, please. Looking at these mapping tools allows us to produce environmental justice maps. Um, I'm a strong proponent of using maps to inform uh, decision-making and policy, and also using maps to tell stories uh, about the situations being shouldered by people in various communities. So the two maps that we see here depict census tracts in New York City. You guys are probably very familiar with that, and also in Houston, Texas. And then we have two data sets overlaid on the census tracts, and one is the percentage of non-white residents within each census tract, which is the color purple. The darker the census tract is colored purple, the more people of color that are living within that community. And then the other is the number of categories that each census tract is qualified under using the CGIS tool, which I've mentioned briefly before. Um, the larger and redder those circles are, the more environmental and economic burdens that that tool has identified within those particular communities. And so looking at these two maps, we can see a, a story that's familiar to a lot of environmental justice uh, researchers and, and advocates, and it's that communities of color are, are located in areas that are shouldering high amounts of environmental economic burden. On the right hand side for New York City, you'll see that as you move north in Manhattan, as we get into Harlem and as we get into Washington Heights and over into the Bronx, you see a lot of these large red and orange circles, which denote that these communities are carrying high levels of economic and environmental burden. 
And those also happen to be the areas where people of color live. That's not an accident. This is a relationship that we see all over the country. You can definitely see that same relationship on the map on the left for Houston. Next slide. And so when we're producing these maps and when I'm analyzing these federal tools, um, a lot of it involves unpacking really complicated data sets. The two graphs on the right are scatter plots depicting the propensity for a particular census tract to have higher levels of asthma based on the population of Latinos on the top map and the population of Black residents in the bottom map. I'm sorry, the bottom graph. Um, the red lines then depict the relationship. So what we see in the bottom graph is that as you get more residents of Black uh, race within a census tract, that census tract is more likely to have higher levels of asthma. Because the red line in the top graph is sloping down as opposed to sloping up the way it is for the bottom graph, that depicts an, a relationship that is the complete reverse of that. So essentially what this is saying is that areas with a lot of Latinos do not experience generally high levels of asthma. Um, this is something that researchers have termed the Hispanic paradox, which is where Latinos don't experience uh, poor health outcomes, even though they experience high levels of uh, environmental and socioeconomic harm in the same way that Black residents do. So that may lead you to believe that, hey, Latinos are experiencing these better health outcomes, and that's great. But when we actually start unpacking the data and we start taking a closer look, it doesn't always tell the same story. So we see that if you look at the numbers on the left, Latinos have a lower asthma rate than non-white Hispanics. But when we start looking at more severe outcomes, such as deaths from asthma or hospitalizations due to asthma, we see that despite having a lower rate, Latinos suffer more in those two categories. So a lot of our work here at WEACT in the data science realm involves unpacking these uh, really complicated data stories to try to get at the lived experiences of the communities that we advocate for. Uh, so that's just a little bit of what I do. And so with that, I'll send it back to Carlos. Thank you so much, Manny. Um, I'm going to pass it off to Tai Long, the EPA. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Tai Long, and I'm with EPA's Office of Environmental Justice and External Civil Rights. And um, basically, a lot of what I do within within that office is leading our work on tools and data sets that can address environmental justice and, and that disproportionate um, exposure of some of these communities that we really care about um, to some of some of that pollution. Um, so I lead our work on EJ Screen. EJ Screen is is a mapping tool uh, that we have been using within the agency since 2012, and we've been sharing it with the public since 2015. And in a lot of ways, I'd say that EJ Screen is one of the original um, environmental justice screening tools. So, you know, there's there's a lot more work around EJ screening and mapping that has gone on in the last um, few years, especially, but in the last like decade, but um, EJ Screen has been out publicly since 2015, and we've been using it even longer than that internally. Um, you know, when we built EJ Screen, uh, can we skip up to the next slide, please? Um, we built it because our former deputy administrator wanted uh, a consistent way to consider environmental justice across the entire nation. Um, so we built uh, basically a web-based GIS tool um, for that national, like, national consistent way to consider environmental justice. The big thing it's doing is, is combining together environmental data with socioeconomic data um, Tyler, like where we could have some vulnerable populations, where populations might be disproportionately impacted by pollution. And, you know, it's really been um, an important starting point for how we talk about environmental justice inside the agency. If I'm talking to our Office of Air or Office of Water, um, we can all use EJ Screen as a starting point, but it's also been really important with how we talk to um, other federal agencies, other state governments. If we're talking to New York City, um, you know, we can all get on the same tool and start with the same base of information. Um, 
And likewise, you know, it's really kind of changed the way that we interact with a lot of communities because, you know, in the past, it was a lot of communities coming to the agency and saying, well, we feel like there is higher levels of, of um, PM in our community, um, but this, but EJ Screen has given them a little tool where they could say, hey, look, we feel this, but we also see the numbers in EJ Screen are elevated compared to the rest of the state, compared to the rest of the nation. And so it's really been um, a very important tool for stakeholders um, and you know, just a lot of people working on EJ. Next slide, please. So the key functions of EJ Screen, um, and I'm not going to get into too much detail on it, but you know, basically what we're doing is we're using like the most up-to-date environmental data, we're using the most up-to-date demographic data, and we you, we're using all that demographic data from the census. Um, we're using the ACS, which is a rolling survey rather than that decennial census, to you to make sure that the data that we're using in the tool is, is the most current data possible. Um, we're also using the highest resolution data available. So we're using block group level data and basically in an urban place like New York City, that's just gonna be a collection of city blocks on average around um, 1200 people per census block group. But you know, getting that really uh, granular data related to neighborhoods is really important for our tool because, you know, when we talk about environmental justice, so much of that happens at that neighborhood level um, that we felt it was really important to get as granular as possible. Um, the other thing that we've done with EJ Screen is that we've been completely transparent about um, all of the data within the tool. So, Everything that we use within EJ Screen is available for download online. Um, so you can get onto our website and you know, download all of the data. A lot of the other EJ tools out there are using a base of EJ Screen data as, as kind of a starting point. And that was always our intent. You know, we didn't want to be the only EJ tool out there, but um, we wanted to provide the ability to other for other people to kind of take what we've used and build on it. Um, we've also made EJ Screen as accessible as possible. So anybody with a computer and an internet connection can get on. You can get on with your cell phone or tablet. Um, and, you know, I always tell people if you can use Google Maps, you can use EJ Screen. It's really intuitive and straightforward tool. But at the same time, it has a lot of really analytical um, advanced capabilities that Otherwise, you'd probably need to have ArcGIS or some of Dave's software to, to really dig into some of the things that are going on in your community. Next slide, please. Um, and, you know, in terms of EJ Screen, we've got our primary EJ Screen data sets, and then we've got a whole wealth of other data that you can pull into EJ Screen. Um, you know, primarily the biggest thing that we're doing with EJ Screen are looking at our EJ indexes and our supplemental indexes. That's where we're combining that environmental data with the socioeconomic data. Um, and if you get onto the EJ Screen website, you can see all the methodology for combining that data together. Um, the environmental indicators are reflected in the, socio in the supplemental and EJ indexes. So for each of the 12 environmental indicators, we have a corresponding EJ index or supplemental index. Um, we've got seven different socioeconomic indicators. We've got three different health indicators and uh, climate data. And, and then we also pull in data on critical service gaps. So some of those really important things to communities like um, access to broadband internet or um, access to medical services, uh, because those are you know just some of those really critical services um, for communities. But on top of that, you know, there is the ability to pull in, um, we have places data in EJ Screen, so you can pull in information on, you know, where all the churches are in your community or schools. You can pull in other environmental data sets. Um, you know, we have a whole wealth of data that you can pull in um, to the maps. And then on top of it, pretty much any other data set that's out there that is a published data set, you can pull that into EJ Screen as well. 
Um, so, you know, we use EJ Screen as kind of a base to start looking at environmental justice, but it's not the end all be all. Um, so I'm really excited to talk to you all about some of the data and um, how we can advance environmental justice with it. And I'll turn it back to you, Carlos. Thank you, Ty. Uh, and Dave, you are our last presenter. Excellent. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. And we really honored to be on this panel with Manny, Ty, and Carlos. Uh, like Carlos mentioned earlier, I manage Esri's New York City office. Uh, we're exclusively dedicated to working with the New York City government agencies. And I've been doing that since 1997. Uh, it's a passion that we have local and uh, it's really, really important work. And we think it's really well connected to the mission today for both open data and environmental justice. The government plays such an important role in the ability to correct injustice, to protect from further injustice and to really importantly in this conversation, enabling communities with data and more. The next slide, please. I'm gonna move quickly through these, Carlos. Uh, so at Esri, we believe that equity and environmental justice requires that we see the world as a single ecosystem, right? And there's three major systems, economic, environmental, and social. Uh, there's a lot to get our minds around, and, but there's a lot of technology and passionate people to help do that. And as we believe that geography plays a critical role in how to uh, combine these systems and take a holistic view. Next slide, please. Uh, we call this the geographic approach because we feel it's a common language that we all share. And that common language allows us to integrate data from many different systems, many different agencies, many different providers, and apply science to that. And what we're all about now, working with the mayor's office and other agencies in the city, is to not only improve what data gets to you in the community, but to go beyond that. How do we help you use that data? Next slide, please. So GIS is a big part of our work. And uh, on the right-hand sweeping side, you see this is a typical flow or process that uh, someone would perform with GIS. And you notice that in each one of those boxes, uh, data is the, the linchpin, the critical component. Uh, it's what we're so proud of what the city's done with their open data. Uh, we think we're all now ready to go uh, to the next level. Next slide, please. Uh, we create technology that enables uh, providing open data, but it's really more than just the data itself, as I keep repeating, it's open government. It's the analysis we perform with that data. It's telling stories with that data, but data is not static, right? Data is living. We need to do a better job at connecting frequently high volume, high transaction data from the government and other providers, businesses, NGOs, combine that all together, and then apply tools on top of that data. We're committed to open data um, capabilities and open source ways to use that information. So not just Esri technology, but all technologies that can participate together. Next slide, please. We're gonna skip past this, just some examples that a lot of people are familiar with, examples of environmental analysis with GS, social equity analysis with GS. Next slide, please. Uh, some of the work we do here locally, uh, I'm really, really proud of the city agencies that we work with. They're, they're really working hard. I can assure all of you that you might not work with them they're using a lot of GIS internally in their operations. But the key role that the mayor's office can play that's really unique is to combine across agencies for that holistic approach. That is super challenging within individual agencies. Uh, it, it's a tough job to do this. There are a lot of mechanics behind the capabilities, the data them itself, the technology to combine information, uh, but that's the forefront, the cutting edge we're at right now, how to, how to work together to combine information and get it out to you in the communities. Next slide, please. Uh, let's see, we might've missed that one. No, that's okay, we don't have that last one. Uh, okay, so Carlos, what I'll just end with is saying that great work is being done, as uh, Ty mentioned, EJ Screen, what Manny referred to with the maps he's creating and others. Uh, it needs to be much, much better. That's the way we're looking at Esri. It needs to be a bi-directional conversation between government and communities. So communities talking back to government through the open data site and other sites. Uh, and we need to go further with our resolution and detail in New York City. Since the tracks are great, it's great that we have that national, super important work being done in the White House and other federal agencies and organizations like WEAC. 
Here in New York City, we can go much, much further. We can go to the block level, we can go to the street edge, to the building level. And that's what we're working with the city agencies to do to deliver it to you in the communities. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dave. Um, so sorry if I cut off a, uh, your that's final fine. slide there, but um, yeah, yeah, excellent presentations. Uh, thanks, Ty and Manny as well um, for sharing uh, what you've been working on um, and for joining us here today. Uh, I'm really excited to dig into these uh, questions and pick your brains and get your perspective on open data and data tools and uh, how it all relates to um, our shared goals around environmental justice. Um, I want to start things off uh, broadly, um, but uh, you know, with the rise of the digital age, uh, data tools and resources uh, and information in general have become more accessible uh, probably than ever before. How has this impacted the policy and advocacy landscape? And do you see, where do you see, you know, more potential in the future? And feel free to just unmute yourself. Hi, Manny and Dave. I'm sorry, Carlos, were you directing it at one of us in particular? No, uh, not, no not, not directed into anyone in particular. Um, but I guess I think, um, you know, Manny, given uh, WEAC's role um, as an advocate, uh, I guess I would love to start things off with, with how you see, you know, data playing a role in um yeah. yeah so i mean it's it's my introduction to we act was was when i first started here last year and it's it's provided you know a new i provided a new uh, resource to the to the organization to be able to analyze some of these data sets and then provide a more informed reaction to some of the federal policies so from from our perspective, you know, having all of these open data sources available, it really allows us to drill down and provide a cohesive narrative as uh, far as what the hurdles are that the communities that we're advocating for are facing. Right. Um, when we have access to, you know, really good air quality data or really good data on, you know, health outcomes for certain populations. It really allows us to make the points that that we're hearing from the residents in these communities as lived experiences, you know. But it allows us to provide, you know, a more quantitative and measured aspect to our, you know, policy advocacy. So, so really, without you know a lot of these open data sources, we're we're not able to to make the points that that we need to make uh, from an EJ perspective. And can I just ask? Um... What are some of the you know the best sources that you use regularly, um, either nationally or, or in New York City specific? Yeah, so a lot of my recent work is uh, thanks to Ty's hard work because we do use EJ screen data quite a bit. Um, we've also you know there's there's various data repositories. The Department of Homeland Security has one that is very good for various infrastructure. So when we're looking at oil and gas. Uh, Commons. So for our methane commons, we wanted to see where oil and gas uh, wells were located in relation to, um, you know, communities of color. That was really beneficial. Um, NOAA has some great uh, data repositories, and and you know, Esri and Dave have have a lot of open data that's integrated. We use ArcGIS, and so there's there's some great data sources that are integrated from there. Um, the single largest data source that we use is definitely the census. Um, with, without census data, we're, 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 we're not able to relay all the, the, you know, scientific and economic concerns that we have back to the people that, that live in those communities. So the census data is a really hugely important data set for us. Yeah. The original open data advocates. Um, yeah, I guess, uh, Dave, I'll, I'll direct this next one to you. Um, I guess we're really interested in hearing what you see as, uh, as the future of open data and, and how it might continue to um, change this this landscape and uh, of advocacy and, and policy development. Yeah, thank you for the question. And I see a question in the chat also I'll address about this back and forth with communities when I'm done responding. So that's one example. It, open data was such a significant breakthrough for those who have been around long enough to know it was really hard to get any data from New York City government. Uh, they, they set the new example globally, frankly, with, with what they've done with the open data site. But that's now generation one, we need to go next generation, you know, 2.0, we need to go to the communities responding back. And there's some of that in the open data site now, you can comment and in individual layers, but um, what we're working on in Esri is what we call a hub 
conversations. Hub is just another web application to communicate with the public. Uh, but the conversation part is what's important. And that's giving the government the tools to engage in a meaningful conversation with the communities. So it's not just, you know, um, typical social media sort of comment, 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 and just flying all over the place. It's, it's more concerted. And maybe if there's interest in particular areas that there's grouping that occurs and that you can enroll or sign up or register with interest in particular areas of data so that the government understands, oh, you're a community member that is passionate in this area. We're going to message you about the next event we do in that space. Another great example is the actual technology itself. Uh, data um, alone is challenging. Right? We, uh, I'm overwhelmed with the information that's already out there and there's more behind the veil internal to the agencies. So what we're working on is to give you the tools in the community to go further. EJ Screen Tool is a great example of this, helping you to find the way you wanna see what's on the map. And we can keep going with this, the concept of cumulative impact, um, scoring, weighting, different layers of information that are of interest to you as an individual or a community group. And then of course, just raising your hand as a community organizer or advocacy group about, hey, why are we not seeing X, Y, Z in the data? And then lastly, I'll end with accountability. Let's hold each other accountable. Like, all right, you put the data out. All right, we downloaded the data. What are we doing with it? Both sides, like, you know, communities holding government accountable. Like, are you going to improve that data? Are you going to update that data? Are you going to listen to me about that data? And then government holding communities accountable. All right, we put the data out there. What are you using it for? Tell us, uh, show us the work. So engage with us as partners. And this is challenging. And I know in New York City, it's super challenging at our size. Uh, but that's why we're here in New York City. That's why we love it here. Let's take this challenge on again. Thank you, Dave. Love that sentiment. Um... Hi, Manny, if you have, any, do you have anything to respond to that or I'll, I can move on. Um, no pressure. Uh, <laughs> I, I really appreciate how you, um, you know, brought up you know, the ways in which we can uh, have communities respond back to government. Um, I think uh, there's been a lot of you know, growing interest in the role uh, that citizen science efforts play um, in not in open data and in, in an understanding sort of the on the ground um, you know, realities. Uh, what role have yeah. you all seen um, citizen science playing in research or data collection around EJ concerns? Um, and have these been developed into public data resources that you're aware of? I have one comment that I want to Please, Dave, monopolize. Yeah. Okay, yeah, two quick comments. I, I, I know I work with one local group in my neighborhood of Gowanus, it's the Gowanus Canal Conservancy. And I know there are a number of individuals there using GIS and taking that to the volunteer members working with students and teaching them the basics they need to learn at that young age of let's go out together and let's map and collect information together. So it, it really is in the hands of the NGOs and the nonprofits, uh, schools, uh, Interestingly, in New York City schools, they have a lot of technology. Uh, I could name a couple of really great ones. The Harbor School, I'll just throw out, outstanding, Governor's Island. But what I've learned, you know, in Esri, we sort of dump, backed up the truck and dumped a bunch of software and like, here, here's, here's technology. You know, see you later. Uh, that doesn't work. And I finally got it in speaking with teachers. They're like, listen, we, we got a full agenda. You know, we got state exams. Uh, I, I can't learn all your great GIS and do my day job. So I, I would challenge all of us. I am challenging my staff. Like we have to go do it with the students. So I know it wasn't a direct answer, Carlos, um, but it is happening out there in the schools. Uh, I think we collectively, people are passionate enough to join this session. Uh, you may already be doing this. We need to do more of that. Get, volunteer our time to help them. These tools. Yeah, I totally understand that. It's something that. Um... I think we at MOCEJ really resonate with, um, it's not enough to just provide, um, you know, these massive amounts of information or, or tech, you know, it has to, uh, um, you know, you sort of need to accompany uh, those efforts with, you know, community capacity building, um, yeah. community engagement. Um, so there's so much, you know, such a, a big need. Um, all too often, I think that, you know, government agencies uh, are asking working individuals and working families to understand, you know, large 
volumes of highly technical data or you know these advanced tools um, in order yeah. to just be able to participate into a, in a decision making process and without providing that necessary support uh, to bring people up to speed um, you know th that that effort uh, has to be taken up by community based organizations or or other you know concerned parties and um, often that goes without a compensation um, yeah. what are the ways that open data tools like the EJ screen, for example, um, can help inform and empower communities uh, with the information they need. Uh, and does anyone here have any experience um, in community uh, engagement um, on, on like the feedback that you've received on, on these tools and, and you know, I guess other efforts to uh, engage and educate communities uh, through these data tools? I'll, I'll, I'll hop in there just because I've had so much experience with that. Um, you know, I think that there's a whole wealth of ways that that EJ screen can and data tools can really change the conversation with communities. You know, it, it's giving people hard data that can actually, you know, drive decision making. And I think empowering people with that really adds so much value to these conversations. Um, you know, I, I think one of the places that we see it the most um, is in like our grant applications. In the past, we used to get a lot more grant applications that just would anecdotally talk about some of the things going on in their communities. But nowadays you're seeing all of these different organizations that are going in and pulling down these like, uh, you know, air quality levels, uh, pulling in all of these different um, demographic factors. And they're, it's really strengthening their, their applications for these EJ grants. Um, we're seeing just all of these different uses. And I think that's one of the things that really kind of um, made me happy when we released EJ Screen to the public is there is a limited way amount of ways that EJ Screen is being used within EPA. But the ways that people are using it outside of the agency are, uh, it's just, it's kind of amazing, like all of the different ways people are using it. We're starting to see a lot of people teaching classes with, with EJ Screen and the data behind EJ Screen on what environmental justice means. We're seeing a lot of research, like the work that Manny's doing. People are taking it, doing research, and they're coming back to us and saying, well, oh, we did all this research. And this is what we found, EPA, how does your numbers compare to that? And, you know, it's, it's kind of just a different world where it's not just EPA that holds the keys and says, this is the official numbers. Now it's, you know, um, we act for environmental justice that's going to come in and say, but we don't have the same numbers. Why? What's going on here? You know, so I think it's really, um, the data has just, it's changed the conversation from a one-sided um, discussion or, you know, someone talking to somebody to a discussion, I would say. That's great. Ty. I concur completely, Ty, and, and I want to throw Manny under the spotlight. It's really where the action happens. And I think folks like yourself, Carlos, in your office and people in my office, your technologists, so to speak, you know, how do we enable organizations like we act even better. And you mentioned capacity building. It, that struck me really strongly because like, you kind of run by that. We sort of assume we all know how to get in a room together and have a conversation because like, maybe a lot of it, we're doing that all day long amongst our little circles. But in my limited work out in the community, I, I see that the awkwardness, the standoffishness, the who's not there, who is there. And I think the Mayor's office has a really powerful role in that, and, P and community advocacy groups like We Act also just get them together. I think there's people like Ty and myself who are hungry for opportunities, like Ty just referred to, like blown away by what's done. Everything we do in Esri GIS training that we throw out there, we're the same reaction, Ty, like, oh, wow, they took it a whole other direction. They didn't even follow that script, and they're, they're telling us, so by the way, it doesn't work. I got this bug over here because you didn't think about the way I wanted to do it. So that only happens in that safe space of capacity building communities. I'd, I'd really love to hear from the group and from Carlos and Manny, and how do we do that better? 
to. With that, can can we, if anybody has questions that they'd like to ask, uh, please raise your hand um, in the last 10 remaining minutes that we have. If there are unanswered questions, use the raise hand feature of Zoom and we will call on you. Great. Eden, uh, let me turn off the on mic. There you go, Eden, now you should be able to unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. This was lovely. Um, I'm, I have, I have two questions. One is very selfish because I'm doing a project and I'm trying to get access to data. Uh, I'm looking for, um, uh, demographic socioeconomic data at the zip code level. And if any of your tools lend to that, I would love it if you could share a link, uh, but that's for my project. Um, I asked in the chat um, how you explicitly or implicitly are connecting environmental justice work and advocacy with economic, social, and political justice, because they just seem to be, in my mind, the, um, the same work on the flip side of a coin. Um, and you're obviously mapping all these things and looking at race as you do it. So you're sort of doing the heavy lift, actually, of, of um, looking at um, broader socioeconomic trends. Um, so I, I wanted one, one of you guys to speak to that, if you could. Yeah, I'd, thank be, you. I'd be happy to answer this one if, if you guys don't, don't mind. Um, yeah, so I think from, from our perspective at WE Act, you know, environmental justice is economic, social, and political justice. There, there's no real distinction for us because in these areas where we encounter, you know, these environmental harms that are that have been placed on communities that have been disenfranchised for so long, um, a lot of that is because of decades of political and economic policy, right? We we see that areas that underwent historic underinvestment through redlining are the same areas now where we see high levels of, you know, education inequality, environmental inequality, um, and economic inequality. And that's all due to the, the political process that, that has been in place over, you know, however many decades since, since that occurred. So it's it's a very holistic approach that we take. You know, uh, our our New York office has a lot of uh, state and local programs where they focus on things such as workforce development. Um, we're an environmental justice organization first and foremost, but you know, elevating people out of environmental harm doesn't come unless you know that they're educated properly, that they they have good education outcomes, and they're able to have. Uh, a good work future and and you know and therefore you know have good health outcomes because they can afford health insurance and you know keep their communities clean they have time to be engaged so it's it's a really it's you know that's a really great question because it's it's a holistic approach you can't have one without the other you can't just go in and you know clean up a community and, and expect uh once the pollution's gone that everything is is status quo and and everyone is caught up in, in equal everywhere so yeah, and then also I threw in a link to uh, the census.gov data, and they have a lot of great uh, resources that you might find useful. The American Housing uh, Survey that, that I think Ty mentioned a little bit earlier is, is just great. I mean, it's it's an awesome resource that that provides a lot of, uh, you know, demographic breakdown, but also uh, economic data as well. I'll just follow on that. I was outstanding, Annie, I agree 100%. And my point earlier about helping the different government departments synchronize and coordinate better, I, I think is necessary to address the, the, the bigger issue of equity across the board, right? Because it's all these contributors, uh, health department, transportation department, et cetera, et cetera. And it, you, where you're gonna find environmental injustice, you're gonna find all sorts of other injustice. So uh, on our side, dealing sort of behind the government screen is that there's some fundamental barriers that are easily addressed. And so we're, we're working hard to make it easier for you and you're on a project and you need a piece of data. It's cross-cutting. It's cross-cutting political, social issues and environmental issues. Yeah, I heard recently um, from a community advocate uh, that good environmental policy is just 
good governance. And that's really how we see it uh, at MOCEJ. Uh, that is why our, you know, our work is just beginning with, you know, this report and mapping tool that we're developing, because um, it would mean nothing if it isn't followed up with, you know, how are we going to actually uh, address these um, barriers and inequities that we've, you know, identified, uh, spent so long to identify, um, how do we, you know, make changes into uh, existing policies and processes that allow for, um, you know, communities to actually speak for themselves uh, and to have their concerns represented. Um, so it all is really tied together. And um, sorry, Ty, if I, if I cut you off there. We have another question in from Anthony. I want to Anthony, yeah, you want to unmute yourself? Um, yeah, I'm Anthony Perez, also at uh, New York City OMB. Um, I, it sounds like we have like a lot of great resources for like kind of painting that cohesive picture of like what environmental justice injustices look like in different communities. And so that informs really like more informed policy, but I'm curious what your experiences have been with like measuring the actual impacts of policy and if you feel like that that is as equally built out or if it's some like an area of improvement, I just kind of want to hear, it's kind of a big question for the last four minutes, but I want to hear your takes on that. Thank you. Uh, so if you want, I'll just, you ready? Yeah, Ty. Well, no, I would say that is, that's a very tough one. You know, um, it is one of the things that, takes many, many years to actually get like good outcome data on some of the work that we do. Um, and so, you know, I don't, I don't think we're quite there as a federal government in terms of trying to get good outcome data, but, you know, one of the things that we've been doing under, under this current administration, there's an initiative called Justice 40. And, you know, that's focused on putting 40% of resources into communities it is supposed to be much more focused on outcomes and measurement of outcomes than we've done in the past. So it is, it's one of those areas that maybe the federal government hasn't done a great job of in the past, but we are more focused on how we can do some met more measurement of outcomes moving forward. So I would just say that's a really tough one um, and we're working on it. Yeah, and Anthony, I'll just add that Ty has very good uh, context. It's a big lift, it's critical, and it's the frontier. It's about the accountability I mentioned earlier. It's that feedback mechanism, but how do you score that? How do you measure it? You can't manage anything you don't measure. Uh, and if if we're not able to associate with impact, you know, it, it's all for naught, right? So we, and that's part of that community engagement piece. And it's also a dimension that we've learned about perception individuals and communities perceive things uniquely. And we've learned this a lot from um, you know, greening spaces in communities, how to even you know, youth, how you see your block, draw us a picture of your block. It's incredibly stark the differences that you receive back, uh, crime and violence also, of course. But uh, so I, I appreciating that perceptions are unique and different and how to take those perceptions in government, how to receive them from the communities and work them. So it's, it's very qualitative, not just quantitative. Uh, and I, I think OMB played a big role in this, Anthony, <laughs> so as a convener and unifier across these agencies. I think we have time for one more uh, question from the audience. Um, I don't know if anyone's ch checking in the chat, but if someone wants to raise their hand. I see uh, Jessica's hand raise. Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess this is more of a fun question, but are there any like new tools that are really exciting to you all um, that you see might be a little bit more accessible or um, have an easier interface for a wider range of people to use? Kathleen made a really great comment um, about data literacy and accessibility and, you know, in, engaging communities is like a long process, right? We got to build relationships over a long time. And if we're throwing data at people that they can't uh, take in, it might harm a relationship. So I'm wondering about any new tools you guys have heard of. Well, I, I might start by putting in a plug for, for ourselves, just because that's been one of the things that we've been kind of focused on for quite a while now. And, you know, with EJ screen, it has continued to build in new functionality, which I think is wonderful, 
but it also makes the tool more complex over time. Um, last year, we did a revamp of the tool to try and uh, bring it back to its basics and put a lot of those functionalities up front um, and make it a little bit more accessible. But this year, one of the things we're hoping to do is to put out a, a more simple version of EJ screen. So we're probably going to keep the more analytical tool, but we also wanted to have like the version that anyone's grandma could hop on to that doesn't know anything about um, data or, or mapping and use that tool and then keep a better, more advanced version for folks like um, a Manuel that wants to actually dig into how we can combine some of this data together in different ways. Um, because there's a need for both. And I don't think that one tool can ever do everything for everybody. So I think that's been one of the things we're trying to focus on. I, I'll follow on that. Uh, excellent. Both suggestions, excellent. And I'll add uh, two more just in the chat as just examples uh, paste in here. And one is um, uh, easier ways to address real policy, not just the data set itself. We call that policy maps. And another one is um, story maps for individuals to create their own story. And these are sort of graphically rich uh, web environments that require you know, no coding or anything. You just simply sort of put in descriptions and pictures and it builds a beautifully mobile responsive web page that's yours. And this is I'm not promoting an Esri on this. There's a number of other great technology providers that do the same thing. Cardo, Mapbox, Google, uh, Esri has one as well, but I'd recommend that we're trying to get that out. We just released like a personal edition. It's you know, no cost, no license or anything. You just use it and build your own. You get this in the hands of students to, you know, look at what they're doing with TikTok. They're telling stories. Let's harness that energy. Let's get it in a constructive uh, channel teach them how to use data with it. So I'd like to echo uh, story maps from Dave. I, I think that's such a great tool that, you know, other nonprofits are using. Uh, I'm going to throw a link in the chat to a really good one that was shared at um, uh, the Esri JS conference down here in DC recently. And it's, it's a New York based story map. And I think you all will find it really interesting. It tells about some of the disparities of COVID in New York and how it played out. And, and it's, it's a really fascinating tool to uh, use maps as as a way to tell stories. Thanks for that, man. Um, yeah, it, it, territorial Empathy, incredible organization. Really great. Everybody check that out. Sorry, Carlos. No, no worries. Uh, or, or no. Oh. Yeah, if you guys got one last slide that I'd like to, to bring us to the end. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, and I was just going to, as we are plugging things, um, I want to say that, you know, that a big hope of the uh, EJMIC mapping tool um, is, you know, that user accessibility and also um, that's why we're focusing so much on the qualitative component of it. We don't want pe to like leave people stranded with these datas or data sets or, you know, maps that are just sort of overwhelming to look at, uh, but accompany that with uh, a lot of information uh, resources that they can be connected to um, and sort of just kind of explain it out to them while also uh, serving as a data repository where you can download that data if, if you want to really get into the weeds. Um, so if you're interested um, in you know staying up to date on our report and mapping tool, uh, I'd encourage you to sign up for our newsletter um, and we'll also be promoting future engagement opportunities. Um, you can scan this QR code or I'll put a link in the chat. Um, if you're interested in viewing the EJ screen tool, you can scan the second QR code. Uh, and also, uh, Esri wanted to share an atlas of community, I mean, sorry, climate resilience, uh, environmental justice, um, which I think is so gets to that story map uh, concept, yeah. right? So Just that's, some examples can... that California's innovating on, but that mm -hmm. might be of interest, even though we're, we're the right coast, we're the better coast, but uh, let's, let's, <laughs> yeah. learn, let's learn from each other. Obviously, yeah.